Hi, Michelle Glass here, and welcome to our first video in our Chapter 19, Lecture 19 series. We are ready to move into the cardiovascular system, which consists of the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood itself. And our first chapter here, Chapter 19, is a discussion of the blood. So we're going to be looking here at the tissue that is the blood and the cells that make up that blood. Now, you've studied blood tissue before when you were... Um, first in AMP1, remember blood is a fluid connective tissue. Connective tissues by definition all include specialized cells located in what is called a ground matrix. So as we look at our blood, we'll see that it consists of three types of specialized cells. This would be the red blood cell or the RBC, the white blood cell or the WBC, and the platelet. So our specialized cells are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Now these are actually going to be referred to as formed elements. And the reason they're called formed elements is because a mature red blood cell in circulation has barely any organelles. There's no nucleus, there's no ribosome. It pretty much kicks all that stuff out in um, the formation of the cell. So it's not... The mature functioning red blood cell is not a cell like what we studied way back in chapter three. And then the same thing kind of goes for platelets. Platelets are actually cell fragments, so they're not gonna have all the full complement of cell structure like we talked about back in chapter three. Now white blood cells do have all of those things that we're used to seeing in a cell, but the other two types of formed elements do not, and so that's how we're getting that name. The ground matrix for the blood is referred to as the plasma. So that's all the uh, water and proteins that are suspended in that solution for the blood. Now the jobs of blood, we already sort of know that the job of the cardiovascular system is to transport material. So we can think about the job of the blood primarily as this network of vessels transporting things around the body. What types of things are being transported? Gases, so this would be oxygen gas and carbon dioxide gas. Nutrients. So once we've eaten food and we've digested it into our um, monomers, glucose and amino acids and fatty acids, all of that's being transported through the bloodstream. Hormones, which we've been talking about extensively in our chapter 18. And then metabolic waste products are also, of course, being transported through the blood. So this is kind of its primary job, but not its only job. In addition, we will see that the blood is important in regulating pH and ions. We'll see blood involved in the formation of blood clots. So this is helping to prevent too much water loss, fluid loss, blood loss um, in the event of damage. We also see that the blood is responsible to help defend against pathogens and toxins. In part, that's the job of those white blood cells. We'll talk about white blood cells in this chapter, and we'll talk about them again as we get into the lymphatic system. And then we also see that the blood is important in helping to stabilize the body temperature. So if the body is really um, cold, then we'll see that your blood is going to move to your deeper veins so that you're keeping the internal organs as warm as possible. If the body's really hot, then you'll see the blood moving to those superficial veins so that you can dissipate some of that heat out into the atmosphere and cool the body down. Now here are just some generic um, I guess generic is a bad choice of word here, but here are just some general descriptions or characteristics of blood. We don't really have to memorize this. Um, what is interesting to note is that your blood temperature is usually a little bit warmer than your overall body temperature. So we see your blood is at 38 degrees Celsius, whereas normal body temperature is about 37. And then here we know normal body temperature is about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, but in the case of your blood, it's at about 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. 
it is five times as viscous as water. So that means that viscosity is talking about the thickness and the way it flows. So think about honey as something that's extremely viscous or syrup. And so blood um, is not as thick as honey, thank goodness, but it's also um, thicker than water for sure. Blood has a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. So notice that that is a number that is larger than seven. So that puts it on the basic side of our pH scale. Now, traditionally, this has been a question on the departmental final. So you might want to go ahead and dedicate the um, pH of blood to memory. And then the next thing to look at is your blood volume is about 7% of your body weight when calculated in kilograms. So it is um, kind of an interesting number there. Okay, looking at whole blood. Whole blood is consisting of really two things, plasma and those formed elements. Plasma is about 55% of the whole blood. So that means when we're looking at um, you know the overall whole blood, the majority of it, or a little bit more than half, is plasma. Now the plasma is primarily water. So this percentage here, 92%, is not talking about 92% of whole blood, it's talking about 92% of the plasma component is water. In addition to the plasma being composed of water, you have lots of things dissolved or suspended in that water. So we're gonna see nutrients, we're gonna see uh, electrolytes, which are ions. We're going to see waste materials and we're gonna see proteins. So of course, we're expecting nutrients and electrolytes and waste. We already talked about this is a important job of blood to transport those things. So they are being transported in the plasma component. Um, and then proteins are gonna be a key, um, you know, component of your plasma, we have a list of, I think, five types, four types, okay. So albumins um, are gonna be the most abundant type. Albumins are going to help maintain the plasma osmolarity. So we studied this term osmolarity um, back in AMP1 when we talked about osmosis. So this is really looking at the, the balance of the um, water and the movement of water either in or out of the bloodstream. Globulins are referring to globular shaped proteins. So remember our quaternary structure of a protein could either be globular or fibrous. In order to be suspended in fluid, it needs to be a globular protein. So globulins is kind of like a whole broad category. A couple that I've mentioned here are immunoglobulins. You probably know these better as antibodies. So immunoglobulins are globular shaped proteins involved in the immune response. So those are antibodies. And then transport globulins. These are gonna be proteins that are gonna help transport materials through the blood. So one example here might be HDL, high density lipoprotein. It is a globular protein that is transporting cholesterol. So when you're getting a measurement from your physician of your amount of HDL cholesterol, you're looking at how much of your cholesterol is being transported by your high density lipoprotein. That term LDL cholesterol is referring to another transport globulin, um, low density lipoprotein. So, you know, one of the key things here is if it's a lipid, it's not going to transport through an aqueous, watery solution of the plasma on its own. It needs to be um, carried around by a transporter, and those transporters will be globulin proteins. Fibrinogen is another important one. This is a... Um, soluble version. So this means it is suspended in the plasma um, and through a process, very detailed steps, which we'll talk about during our discussion of hemostasis, fibrinogen will be converted to fibrin, which is insoluble. So it's going to come out as a strand. It's going to be involved in the formation of our blood clot. Fibrinogen remember, is the soluble version. So that means it is, um, you know, being transported through the blood all the time. 
um, not spontaneously by any, any standard um, coming out of the plasma. And then the last is really just like a broad group. So enzymes and hormones can be listed here. Remember we have both amino acid derived and peptide derived hormones. So they would be fitting into this group here. And then enzymes are of course, those important proteins that are catalyzing chemical reactions. So we're gonna see a variety of these in the blood as well. So these are our important proteins and we need to be familiar with the functions of albumins and examples of globulins and the significance of fibrinogen is going to come back in our discussion of hemostasis. That's one word, hemo, H-E-M-O, stasis. Close but different from homeostasis, so make sure you're paying attention there. These proteins are primarily being produced by the liver. So 90% of our plasma proteins are coming from the liver. So this is why if you have um, damage or disease of your liver, this is gonna cause some significant problems in your cardiovascular system. And that's gonna then lead to the damage and breakdown of other vital organs, um, you know, and lead to death if not, um, not treated. Remember your blood is composed of plasma, but then also formed elements. So if the plasma is 55% of your whole blood, then we can describe those form el formed elements as consisting of 45% of your whole blood. So what this means is more than half of your blood is the plasma, and then the remaining is the formed elements. Formed elements we said earlier can be called the red blood cell, the white blood cell, and the platelets. I've introduced some new terms here. Your red blood cell can also be referred to as an erythrocyte. This is the majority of your formed element. So when we say it's 99.9%, .9%, that doesn't mean 99.9% .9 of the whole blood. That means of the category formed elements is primarily the erythrocyte or the red blood cell. You know that already. You looked at blood in part one in your lab, and when you were looking at your blood tissue, you should have identified it really based on the appearance of those red blood cells. So you already saw that. And then you saw kind of uh, sporadically throughout the slide some of those stained white blood cells, which are called leukocytes, so that's another name for a white blood cell. And then the platelets are not visible on this slide at all, so you weren't actually able to see those. When we talk about leukocytes and platelets, then collectively they only make up 0.01% of our formed elements. So formed elements are primarily red blood cells. Those white blood cells are um, not very high in circulation because they will actually leave the cardiovascular system and go to other tissues, so we'll talk about that. And then um, those platelets are gonna be traveling around in the um, cardiovascular system, but in small numbers. Okay, that's it for now.